morning, church family. It's a pleasure to uh, be here today. We began the day during our quick time in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We were looking at really the chapter 7, you know, verses 1 and following. But as we begin our time together today, I want us to be reminded, uh, as uh, Dr. Schofield reminded us from verse 13, he says, When I shut up the heavens, so after this great moment of glory, uh, then the Lord comes to Solomon and says, When I shut up the heavens, so that there is no rain or command the locust uh, to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Then it says, if, you see that conditional statement, my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, then I'll hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And so what a God, what a God we come to worship today. Good morning to all of you. Uh, guests, we're honored to have you with us this morning. We want to say a special thank you for joining us. Uh, we trust you'll find our fellowship one that hungers to uh, do three main things. Love God, serve others, and go into the world uh, to make disciples who make disciples. We would love to connect with you, our guests, to get to know you, uh, to hear how God is working in your life. Uh, you can simply text the word WELCOME to 803-590-1975, or you can scan the code that's on the screen behind me, or you can fill out one of the little connect cards that you should find there in front of you in the view. So we want to get to know you. If you do fill out one of those cards, you can simply drop it off uh, in one of the boxes on your way out. If you're interested in knowing what's going on in our fellowship, you can text the word loop to that same number, or scan the code on the screen, and you'll be digitally signed up to be in the loop for all that's going on. Speaking of what's going on, next Sunday evening at 5 p.m. in the GO building, we will be launching our Equip Family Discipleship. Uh, that will happen while the children are in Equip Kids on Mission, and so I wanted to give you a little preview about that Equip Family time that happens next Sunday evening at 5. So take a look at the screen. If you start out your job knowing how long this kid's going to live, everything changes. And I happen to know how long every kid lives. They live forever. Our decisions, our lives are going to affect 10 generations down the road. With the birth of our firstborn daughter, I literally had the feeling of wanting to turn her over if I were the instructions. When you look at scripture, it's not the children's minister or the youth minister that God calls first to disciple children. It's the parents. If we want to expose our kids to God, we need to view them like God views them. God is an incredible father. God has those kids. Don't be put off because they're not listening to you. They are listening, but in a different way. You're showing them how faith connects to real life. That's really valuable in terms of helping kids understand how faith matters to them. I think there was somewhat of a fear that we're not going to be able to go out and do all the things that we got to, like our marriage is going to look different. I get worried that I'm not doing enough. Make sure. It's going to be a little <laughs> Michael Jr., I was wondering what your feeling is on spankings. I'm a grown man. I don't get them no more, bro. <laughs> No matter what kind of a family you come from, you can be the first of a healthy generation. <coughs> so that's just a little taste of the discipleship opportunity that we have starting next Sunday evening. Uh, speaking of next Sunday, our Equip Pray ministry is moving to Sunday morning. So we're doing Sunday nights at 5. We're now doing Sunday mornings. We'll gather at 8.30 in the... Uh, choir room, which is basically in the room behind this wall. So I hope that you'll come uh, join with us next Sunday morning, 830, for a time of intentional prayer uh, for our church, for our community, for our nation, for our world. I do hope that you're making plans for our Churchwide Family Fall Festival on Sunday afternoon, September 25th. We have invite cards for you to use to engage your neighbors, ask them to come and build relationships while we enjoy uh, great fellowships and food. There will be inflatables for the kids. I hope that you will come and be a part of that time. We are honored to have Dr. Chris Schofield and uh, Tammy and their family here with us today. 
Uh, we certainly are grateful for your leadership already, Dr. Schofield. We'll have a little more formal introduction in a moment, but just a, a way to say thank you. Thank you, Tammy, for coming, uh, for inviting the family. We've been honored during our time already. We look forward to your teaching today. We would ask church family that if the Lord leads you to give a special offering uh, just on behalf of their ministry, you can receive, we'll receive that today in one of the offering boxes or next Sunday as well. So as, as the Lord uh, lays on your heart to bless them as they blessed us, we ask that you might consider a special love offering. We are celebrating the Lord's Supper today. If you're uh, prepared to take the meal spiritually but haven't yet received one of the elements, I just want to ask you right now if you would just raise your hand, one of our deacons. Uh, we'll make sure that you get one of those elements. Can you get one for me too, honey? All right. Well, let's pray as we begin our time together this morning. Father, as we come to you today, we recognize that you are sovereign over us. And your goodness has been displayed to us in so many ways throughout the week. And, and our time together here, Father, is, is a time of corporate celebration for where we've seen you at work throughout the week. I recognize, Father, that in this room there are those who might be saying, I didn't see God this week. Some who, because of health concerns, because of financial crises, because of a child uh, in the home that's just seeming to, to be wayward, I, I recognize that there may be those who are saying, where are you, God? And I pray that today they might sense your presence in a new and fresh <coughs> way. That you bring us to the desperation that we've been speaking of during our conference this weekend. Well, there's a church family. And we repent of those ways in which we, we made it about us and not about you. Where we were seeking the, the, the program, the, the ministry, the, the comfort that just met our particular needs instead of met the needs of your people that you have gathered here corporately. I ask that you would forgive us. Forgive us for the ways we neglected your word this week. Pray that by your spirit as you open Ezekiel 37 to us. The ministry of Dr. Schofield using his mouthpiece to declare to us the hope of life coming back to dry bones. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I can stay together as we sing together and you hold me fast.
together. Acts 17. God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and behind Him, yet He is actually not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Let's remain standing as we sing together, Lord, I need you. Father, just come before you now. We do recognize our need for you. Uh, Lord, it's, it's a sweet thing to be able to come and to pray, to say we, we need you. Lord, I, I remember this day 20 years ago. I remember how it felt. I remember how you squeezed our nation. I remember how many of us didn't respond. And so, Lord, I pray that we will respond even now. <coughs> So that no more calamity like this is brought upon us. Lord, but let's be reminded, though, that even in times of calamity, all times, we need you. Yeah. So we give you all praise, Jesus. Thank you. 
time to, to get to introduce our speaker. Somebody is a near and dear friend to me is Dr. Chris Schofield. He's been instrumental in, in, in my life. I, there's many ways I can tell you how he's been instrumental. Um, but one is that he helped bring Lacey and I together. So the love of my life, and then he was the one that, how to say I do to one another, he helped lead that time. And so I'm thankful for him. Other than my Thanksgiving on life that I had, he's, he's helped spark prayer movements across this nation. Many of you heard of praying on the mountain, some of that the Lord used Dr. Schofield to help bring about over a million people now that have signed up to say, I will pray for our revival in our nation. If you don't know about it, look it up. Praying on the mountain. He's also been a prayer leader for the last 25 years in this nation, predominantly in the state of North Carolina, as he served the North Carolina Baptist Association there as the leader in prayer, but also for the North American Mission Board. He has four lovely daughters and seven grandchildren. His lovely wife, Tammy, is here with us. And so just thankful that we have him to come and to share God's word today. As many of you know, we, Pastor Chris and I got together last fall. And we thought through, okay, what sermon from this week? Because we we're reading the word of God together as a church family. And so Pastor Chris and I went away and we prayed and prayed about which passage from each one of those weeks of reading would we preach from that week? This week came to Ezekiel 37, and I said, Pastor Chris, I know who I would like to preach Ezekiel 37. It's Dr. Scofield. And so I said, let's have a prayer conference with him. And so it's a sweet thing that we have him here, and I hope that you will turn your ears on because he's going to be speaking from the Word of God. And I pray that revival will break out right here. Not just because of the series of what we mean, but because of the hearts being turned to the only one who can change us. So, Dr. Schofield, I'd like to welcome you now. Would you guys give him a warm welcome? I'm a little wrapped up here, sorry. <laughs> Am I not on? Are you on? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I can hear it now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great to be with you in the house of the Lord. Had a good session this morning together. Great spirit. Um, very grateful for my family that's here. Tammy and her family. Uh, just sweet to, to see you all here. And I'm excited about what God's doing in the life of this congregation in the area of prayer. It's been neat to, to get a, a sense of the heartbeat of your church yesterday and today and how the Lord is leading you as a body of believers to seek the Lord. So I pray that in the days to come that God will use you as an instrument in the catalyst for his glory and his honor, that he might be exalted and that he would truly use his church uh, to spark something in this area, spark something in this state and in this nation, that uh, there would be a movement of his Holy Spirit that would spring out of the praying that happens in the life of this congregation. So may God accomplish his great work here. It's got to start somewhere. And it doesn't matter the size, it doesn't matter the numbers, it doesn't matter anything related to buildings or budgets or anything like that. What matters is the heart. And God can use a church and the heart of a church for his glory and his honor uh, to see revival and awakening come. And we're looking for what God will do right here. Amen? Let's bow for a prayer. Lord, thank you for this day for the privilege that we have to gather around your holy word. And we pray uh, that you would speak. Uh, Father, it is, it is, this is your time. 
uh, your time to reveal yourself to us. And so our prayer is that of the Psalter. Reveal your work to us, your servants, your majesty to the generation to come. And so, Lord, uh, accomplish your redemptive and holy purposes in our hearts, in our lives, for the sake of your name and for the sake of your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Ezekiel 37. And we're going to put in at verse 1 here. We're going to look at this great, uh, uh, if you will, uh, passage that relates to the dead, dry bones. Now you say, oh, no, we're going to talk about dead, dry bones. That's not a fun subject at all. But we're going to look at this in light of uh, the context and also in light of what God is doing and what God is promising in the hearts of his people with regard to his great restoration. Uh, you know, God is the God of restoration and uh, he is the only one that can restore us. He's the only one that can redeem us. He's the only one that can truly bring us out of the mire, out of the pit and set us on level ground. And we're grateful for that. And God is promising this kind of a, a promise uh, or bringing it, this kind of a promise to his people. Uh, in Ezekiel 37, ministering in the 6th century B.C. Uh, as he ministered to the people of God as uh, uh, the uh, exile has been taking place, the people of God have been devastated uh, through the judgment of God. What has happened to bring about the valley of the dead dry bones in this vision is that God is devastating his people. He has brought devastation to his people because they have sinned. And we've been talking about revival this weekend. And the three seasons of time, the Kairos times when God sends revival to his people. And, and we talked about yesterday morning, this element of the dependence of God's people upon his people, upon uh, uh, him to bring revival. They depend as they pray and they seek him with all their heart, like the, like the church in the book of Acts. God's people were a people who were walking with him. They were a people who uh, were people of prayer. And so they depended upon him in the first century. And they saw great and wondrous things happen. And God sent revival uh, during a time when his people are dependent upon him in heartfelt and unceasing prayer. So uh, that's one season. Now, Kairos time, if you work here over the weekend, Kairos time is a season in the scripture. Uh, there are three kinds of time. There is eternal time. There is uh, uh, chronos time, chronological time. And then there is Kairos time. Kairos time is when God reaches into chronological historical time and he sends revival. And he brings about a movement among his people. He may reveal himself to his people uh, uh, regarding the, the will of God. He may bring about a, a season of, of great renewal among his people. He may bring about a great season of harvest among his people. But it is a season in time when God reaches into chronological historical time. He works redemptively. And it happens every time somebody is converted to Christ. God is the only one that can do that. And so in the midst of that, we see that God brings revival during times when his people are dependent upon him. We also see and looked at this morning that God brings revival and spiritual awakening when his people become desperate for him. We looked at that great text in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And that is that when, when, uh, when uh, uh, Solomon is... Uh, 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 anointing the temple and they have finished the work of God in building the temple. It is uh, it's a beautiful time and season for the people of God. They're on the mountaintop. But the Lord says to him as a leader, Solomon, there's going to come a day when my people depart from me. They're going to turn away from me. They're going to sin against me. And I'm going to have to bring calamity into their lives. So I'm going to bring the locusts and I'm going to bring uh, the plagues and I'm going to uh, bring the pestilence and I'm going to stop the rain and, uh, and I'm going to squeeze them because I love them and, and, and I want them to return to me. And as a leader, Solomon, you're going to have to know how to lead them back. 
And here's how you lead them back. If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face then and turn from their wicked ways, then I will what? Hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It's a beautiful picture of God's people becoming desperate for him. They realize that they are, are, are uh, being judged by him and that he has his back to them. And they need to see his face and his favor and his presence with them. And so it's in the midst of that that God's people, they repent and they return to him and God heals their land. So that's the second season. Now the third season in scripture when God sends for God. And that is after he has had to devastate them. After he has had to bring calamity and calamity and calamity into their lives and they hadn't repented. They hadn't gotten it. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't returned to him. And so he destroys them. He sends them into exile. He, he brings about a time of devastation in their lives. And out of the devastation, he raises up a remnant of people. A remnant of people to seek him with all their hearts. A remnant of people who will desperately cry out to him and long for him and look for him and desire him like never before. And that's what we find in Ezekiel chapter 37. God has brought his hand of judgment to his people. And he has devastated them. And my brothers and my sisters, I, I believe we're in the second season in the life of the church in America. We are in a time when we can become desperate for God. The window is still open for us to seek the Lord and to return to him. And he can send a mighty movement of his Holy Spirit across the church and in this land. I believe that that day is still a day that can take place. I believe the window is narrowly, uh, is, is, is continually low, getting more narrow every single day. And one day, that window was shut. If God's people do not return to him, if we in the American church do not repent, if we do not truly seek him with all of our hearts, then there will come a day when God will close the door, close the window. And he will bring great devastation upon us. I mean, I'm talking great devastation. You say, well, we've seen a lot of things happen right now. Yes, we are. But we know nothing. We know nothing of devastation. When God chooses to bring his people into exile and to devastate them, it is a terrible and tragic day of the Lord for the people of God. And we do not want that as his people. You know, I hear people saying a lot of times that they say, all we need is a good dose of persecution and the church might get right. Well, you better be careful what you pray for. Because we do not want to see the hand of the Lord against us. We want to see his favor. Amen. And so the people of God have experienced the hand of the Lord against us. And in Ezekiel 37, I want to read to you uh, this passage. And we'll just kind of work our way through the text because there's some elements here of revival, some components of revival especially that we can pray toward as the people of God uh, that I think are essential uh, to bring about a great movement of God. And so I, I believe with all my heart that God has put this passage in here to give us hope, to give us this, this great hope that even in the midst of dead, dry bones, God can send revival. And I read this little, uh, little introduction to a chapter in a book it was written in 1969 by Robert Coleman in, this, in the fellowship hall earlier. But I want to read it to you all because many of you may not have been in there. But listen to this introduction. This was written by Robert Coleman in a little book called Dead Bones or Dry Bones Can Live. 
revival in the local church. And he, he wrote this in 1969. Listen to the word. It says, men everywhere are sensitive that something is missing in the life of the church. We have a form of religion, but no power. For most churchmen, there is no thrill in personal devotions, no spring in the step, no shout in the soul. The joy of sacrifice is gone. Complacency is the norm. While the church flounders in mediocrity, the world plunges deeper into sin. For the average person, life has lost its meaning. It is eat, drink, and be merry with every person for themselves. The sacredness of home and family is forsaken. Standards of decency in public and private are debased. A spirit of lawlessness pervades the land. But the day of reckoning is sure to come. Moral and spiritual decline has its limits. There comes a time when we must reap the folly of our ways. And that's so true, isn't it? We will reap what we sow. Look what he says. Already we are beginning to see the disintegration of enduring values in society. And unless something happens soon to change our course, civilization as we know it is on its way out. But there is hope. Dry bones can live again. Do we really believe that? Let me tell you, I'm in different churches all the time. And sometimes they're very small churches and they're very dry. And I wonder, can they live again? And then you hear stories of God bringing great movements of his spirit and reviving and revitalizing churches that at one point everybody gave up on. And they said, oh, they're never going to amount to anything. They're going down the tubes. And God does a great work. He says that I believe this in 1969. He said, dry bones can live again. In other days of crises, when catastrophe has threatened, men have turned unto the Lord and found in him deliverance and strength. In fact, our greatest spiritual awakening have come during the darkest periods of church history. Perhaps again, the perils of this age may bring us to our senses. What a, what a great statement. It could have been written today, couldn't it? But what he's trying to say is there is hope. And the reason there is hope is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. Now, Ezekiel 37, the scripture says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. And then he calls me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bone, hear the word of the Lord. Now, let's stop there for just a moment. The first principle of spiritual awakening and revival that we see here is the element of God's instrument. You see, Ezekiel is being used here as an instrument of revival among his people. He is God's instrument, and he would be his mouthpiece, and he would be uh, uh, someone that God would take his message and deliver it to the people of God. But he has prepared Ezekiel for this. This moment in the life of the, the people of God was a devastating moment. You, you must realize that as they look across the valley, they, they see these dead dry bones. They see the devastation of God's hand being against them. And if God is against them, no one can be for them. And God has destroyed them. And God has taken their leaders into exile. And, and, and there is great devastation. Uh, among the people of God in, in, in there in Jerusalem. So what we see here is this moment and period of time when God has prepared his messenger to be his messenger of hope to the people of the Lord. And he does so by preparing him spiritually. 
He was prepared and available. Look at what the scripture says here. It says, the hand of the Lord came upon me. God's hand would not come upon someone whom he had not prepared. His hand means that his favor is there with him. And he has chosen him as an instrument in his work. And look at what the scripture says here. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. Second of all, he was anointed with the spirit of God. That anointing is so essential in the life of any instrument. Uh, we must see God's spirit at work in the hearts and lives of his servants. The servants of God, his servants, his people, possess his spirit. And what he is saying here, though, he has brought the special anointing of the spirit of God upon his servant to be his messenger in his mouthpiece in this day in his hour. God's hand was upon him, y'all. And he had prepared him for this day and this hour. And God will do that in our hearts and our lives. It's so interesting. Um, <clears throat> about everywhere that I go, I'll run into somebody that will come up to me and they will say to me, you know, about five years ago, God got a hold of my heart. And I began to pray, or I began to get a group of people together to pray for revival and spiritual awakening. He, he broke me, and they'll have tears in their eyes. And he said, God broke me. And he just gave me this, this, this urgent desire in my heart to call God's people to pray. And uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing to see that happening all over. Where you, you, it, it's not, not a multitude of people, but you may see one or two in a congregation or, or so where God has gripped their heart in such a way. And he has filled them with his spirit to give them perseverance. Listen, folks, mobilizing God's people to prayer takes perseverance. It will take the, the anointing and work of the spirit of God in your heart and your life to be able to do that. Pastors that seek to lead their churches they must have the spirit of God. Sunday school leaders, all as Christians, we need the work of the spirit in our hearts and our lives. And Ezekiel here, God is preparing the way in his heart to be that kind of instrument. By It says, the spirit of God has led me out. He has directed me. He has set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Now what's interesting here to me is this. That, that Ezekiel is set down right smack dab in the middle of the valley of the dead dry bones. Now that would not be a very pleasant picture to, or pleasant place to be. But God in this, this heavenly vision, he sets him down. He shows him the devastation. You know, we've got to see the spiritual famine that's in our community, in our land, before we'll ever be burdened to be God's instrument, to seek him on behalf of those who are experiencing that famine in their lives. We've got to see them. We've got to see them from God's perspective. And sometimes it's so easy in life, and you do it as, and I do it. We, we go by people and we go by circumstances and we hear things that have taken place, tragedies and things and all kinds of stuff and, and families falling apart and we, we just seem to turn it off. And we say, oh, that's bad. Oh, I pray for them. Oh, wow. And right in our own communities, people are being torn apart by sin. And, and sometimes it's so easy for us just to, to have a, to take a cursory look at it and not a long look at it. And, uh, and, and what Ezekiel is being shown here is a long look. He's being given the opportunity to see with his own eyes the devastation that God has brought to his people. And, and this is a lesson for Ezekiel, his instrument. And God is saying, this is what can happen when my people will not return to me and my people decide that they are going to do it their way. And that's a very tragic time in the life of the people of God. And so what this is doing in the heart of Ezekiel, it is putting fire in his bones, y'all, to see this, this devastation and to realize that he would be a mouthpiece of God 
to bring hope to these people is and, and to bring hope to these dead dry bones. <laughs> wow! Only God could do that. Now, it's interesting what else takes place. Look at here. And I love this. It says, Then he called me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And he said, Indeed, they were very dry. And so you get the big picture. And scripture is so descriptive here. It's so, so neat to see how God describes it. There were very many and they were very dry. The devastation was great. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, how would you have answered that? You know? I, I oftentimes think about that. Some of them, can these bones live? I probably would have said, oh yeah, Lord, they can live. <laughs> well, what would you have said? Oh, oh no, no, God, there's, there's no way these bones are ever going to live again. But that's not what he did. He didn't answer yay or nay. Look at how he answered God. He said, so I answered, oh Lord God, you know. Isn't that interesting? But what it demonstrates to us, number one, is the spiritual maturity of Ezekiel. Because what has happened in Ezekiel's heart and life is this. The Ezekiel has come to realize the calling of God in his life. He's also come to realize that without the presence of God, he could do nothing. But thirdly, he's also come to realize that that was God's work. It wasn't his work to revive those bones. He couldn't do it. He couldn't make it happen. He could, he could have all the strategies in place and all the plans uh, that he had put together. And uh, boy, he could have he, he uh, uh, gotten all these morticians together and put all these bones and try to get match this bone to that bone and he could have done all these kind of things. But what Ezekiel has come to realize is that when, when God calls us to a task, that we've got to focus on our obedience and his work in us and through us rather than accomplishing the task. Because accomplishing the task is God's work. In other words, we answer that call, we go, and we leave the results up to God. Now that's hard. That's so hard for us as people. And for men, man, it's doubly hard for us. Because we want to fix it all. But what I, what I see here is him saying to the Lord, Lord, Lord God, you know, that's not my work. My work is to be your instrument. And, and sometimes, and, and here's the good part about it. Let me just say that. Is that when we come to grips with that, it helps us in our journey as a Christian to realize that that weight of changing people and changing circumstances and situations has been taken off our shoulders. We can't make it happen. Regardless of how much we want it to happen. It may still burden us. It may, it may, we'll carry that burden to our grave sometime. But we can't make it happen. And old Ezekiel said this. He says, Lord, you know. And then the scripture says in verse 4. And he get, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O Lord, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So this brings us now to the second component that is so essential for revival and awakening to take place. And, and what you see is not only did God raise up instruments, and God has always do, he will always do that. God has always used men and women, boys and girls, as his instruments. Uh, for revival and awakening. But, but the second component is this, and that is you've got to have faithful proclamation of the word of the Lord. The word of God must go forth. The truth of God 
must be proclaimed. We must share the word. And, li and I love this great verse in verse 4. It just kind of sums up what you'll see in the next few verses. Uh, it says, again, he said to me, he said, it says, prophesy into these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word. Now, the description here of that term word is very interesting, but it describes this, this element of a prophetic word uh, that God would give through his servant. So it's a special anointed word that God would give to his people uh, through his servant. And then in verse five, he says this, he says, thus saith the Lord God to these bones. Sure. Do you see that? Sure. Isn't that a great word? Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I, not I might. What is God saying? Right here, the promise. This one little word. He says, sure. And you know, when God lays that promise in our hearts, whatever it is, surely I'm going to do this. Then we can with confidence move forward to do the things that God called us to do. And, you know, I think about Ezekiel and I think about him being there and thinking, boy, then these bones, they are dry and this is, a, this is a bad situation. I mean, God, what have you gotten me into? And then God says to him, surely, surely, you be faithful to deliver the word, God's word. You know, the scripture is this very, just a cursory look. It's living, it's active, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It's, it's, it's able to pierce between joint and marrow and soul and spirit. It, it's able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word. Nothing is all creation is hidden from God's sight because of that very thing. God's word. God's word is powerful. And, and God's word is alive. And so when, when, when he is told to deliver the word of God, at that moment, in that time, he's thinking, oh God, what are you going to do? And then God says to him, surely, surely. What does that mean to you? What does that little term mean to you? Surely. <laughs> you know, it's almost like a little slang term, isn't it? You think about it. Sure. But what it means is this will be done. That's a promise for God. So he said, surely I will call breath to enter into you and you shall live and I will put sinews on you and cover and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and then you shall know that I am the Lord. And I, so Ezekiel, his testimony, here it is. He says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. So here you have this instrument that's been set aside for this difficult task who now obeys the Lord, who says, God, uh, you know if you're going to revive these people. And God says, surely I'm going to do it. And now Ezekiel says, I'm going to I'm going to proclaim the word of the Lord and I'm doing it. And look at what the scripture says. Sudden. Ah. Ooh, that's a term, isn't it? Sudden. He says, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. Now, can you imagine, y'all, being in that valley? Now, you remember there were very many bones and they were very dry. And so that meant that the bone rattling became very loud. And so when he, when he heard that rattling, Suddenly. Now, you know, a number of years back, I was with a, 
gentleman by the name of Richard Owen Roberts. He's probably the it's a, probably the foremost authority on revival and spiritual awakening. It's still alive. He's ninety. He's got to be ninety one now. Uh, in, in in North America, probably in the world, he is he's a walking uh, book on revival and spiritual awakening. But we were talking at dinner one night, and I asked him. I said, Mister Roberts. I said, do you ever become discouraged of, in your work of calling God's people to revival and awakening? He, he looked at me immediately, you know, immediately with a twinkle in his eye. And, and I can't describe to you that twinkle. But he says, oh no, quite rarely. <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, what do you mean? You don't really get discouraged? And he said, no, quite rarely do I get discouraged. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, tell me about that. He said, well, it's because I live by the biblical principle of suddenly. I said, by suddenly? What do you mean? He said, well, he said, suddenly those dead dry bones started grabbing. In Ezekiel 37. He said, suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon those in the upper room. And he said, suddenly the angels appeared to the shepherds on the hillside. He said, and I live my life every day looking and praying for God's next sudden. Suddenly, the bones begin to wrap. Before there can ever be a suddenly, there's got to be a surely. But when God promises with that word surely, there's going to be a suddenly, y'all. And it's a coming. And the scripture here says that the bones came together, bone to bone. We're all reminded of that children's song, the knee bone connected to the thigh bone and all that. I mean, you really think about this beautiful, beautiful picture of God's restoration. And the scripture says here that indeed as I looked, the sinews and the flesh grew upon them and the skin covered them over but there was no breath in them. And so all of a sudden, you have a corpse there. The bones have come back together. Now, Here's this great heavenly vision that God has given Ezekiel of the dead dry bones, of the devastation. And, and God said, surely I'm going to do this. And all of a sudden the, the, the bones started rattling and they came back together and there's these dead corpses laying all over the place. But they're missing something, which brings us to the third component here. And that is the spirit of God. If we ever can see revival, we've got to see a renewed and refreshing work of the Spirit of God to take place in the church and through the church. And, and, and <clears throat> the scripture, look at what it, how it describes this. It says, indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, he said, you prophesy to the breath and you prophesy, O son of man, and you say to the spread, in other words, he's saying, you pray, you seek the Lord. This, this little term, to prophesy to the breath, is saying, you ask of me to send this wind of the Spirit to come. He says, you, you prophesy to the breath, son of man. And you say, come from the four winds, O breath. The root of God, the Spirit of God must come. If they're ever going to live, God's going to breathe life into them. These dead, dry bones are corpses. They're all put together. They have all the organization they need, but they don't have life. When people come through this back door of this church, they're not looking for all the organization that you can have. They're looking for life. They want to see life in your eyes. They want to see the life of Christ live there. That's what they're looking for in every church. The life of Christ. And that's what these bones are missing. And the scripture is so clear here that he had to pray 
for life. We're in the midst of a great decline in the life of the church in America. Wow. I would be honest and say that some 80 to 90 percent now of churches after we've come through COVID are in decline or they're maintained. That means they need life. And I'm living. There's a, there's a little glow, but there's no bright light shining. And the only way it's going to happen is for God's people to say, Lord, breathe on us. Come. Because what we've got to realize is what we've got, to, we're, what we're missing is the manifest presence of God. I, sh I shared this the other, the, the other morning. But dear brother that has impacted my life over the last four years in ways I cannot even describe. Uh, Fred Lunsford was praying on a mountain, John mentioned it. He said when he was a little boy preaching, he's been preaching for 70 plus years. He said when he was a little boy, he could just, he said you could just sense. And he said I would, uh, he said you could sense the presence of God. He said when I became a pastor and a preacher, he said I could go in different churches and and, and, and it, it didn't matter about the sermon. <laughs> he said, but when, when God, people were invited to the Lord, he said the presence of God was so strong, they just came. He said the altars were full, people were weeping, they were broken over the famine in the, in the area and the community and the sin and, and, and the lostness. And he said, it's just er, er, ever since then, though, I've seen that waning every day. So here in the life of this text, the scripture is very clear that breath is a necessary in the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God. And look what it says. And it says, so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and they stood on their feet an exceedingly great one. <laughs> The dead dry bones became an exceedingly great army. And the difference was you had a messenger that went to them and was obedient and left the results up to God. And he proclaimed the word of God, the truth of God. And that began the bones of wrath. And God promised, surely it's going to happen. I'm going to put breath into him. He says, you've got to pray and you've got to seek me for the breath of God to come. And he did. And God's power and his spirit and his breath came. And that army stood. <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> they stood. They came, he, they came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet. You know what an army is doing when it stands on its feet? It's ready to go into battle. Then in this great text, as we close today, the last component, it's got to happen. <coughs> not only do we need an instrument, not only do we need the word, not only do we need the spirit, but we need a renewed hope in what God can do. And, and, and it's interesting that you, you have in this text, this vision explained. You don't, we don't always get that. And this is powerful. And so Ezekiel is, is, is told by the Lord what all this means. And I want to read it to you. And what it brings is great hope, y'all. And look what he says. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Now that's how the people of God were looking at this season in their life. They've been devastated. Our hope is gone. We've been cut off. God has dropped us off the radar screen. No more. 
And then he said, but here's what I want you to say to my people. Prophesy and say to them, thus saith the Lord. Notice that. Thus saith the Lord. This is not Ezekiel. This is the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. And of course, the word know is an intimate knowledge, experiential knowledge of God. They are going to experience God. He says, you may know. And he says, <clears throat> then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. The distinctive of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Christ. The death, burial, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what we proclaim. Amen? That's, and then look at here. Look at what he says. And then I will say, I will put my spirit in you. God lives in us. You shall live. And I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Say of the Lord. So here is this great vision. And he, he looks, and he says, not only is God going to revive us, which he did in the post exilic time. <laughs> Uh, in Nehemiah's time, great time for the people of God. Just before 400 years, uh, that's, that's another sermon, just before the 400 years of, of no prophetic word. But he's looking down through the ages, y'all. And he's seeing the Messiah, the Christ. Down beyond that, coming, second, coming. Of the Lord. Just look. I'm going to put my spirit in you. You're going to know that I, the Lord, have done this. But he's looking at that time when the Spirit of God would live in his people. And it brings great hope because his people realize there is this great promise. And it's the Christ. He's coming. One day. And right now we live in that same hope, don't we? That he's coming again. But we live in the spirit now. And the spirit lives in us. And there should be great hope in this hour of darkness because of the spirit of Christ who lives in us. Because we know that he's alive. That he's not in that grave. And if we have that promise, surely the grave is not going to hold us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. And so with that comes this great picture of hope out of the valley of the dead dry bones to the people of God who have been devastated by God because they have sinned. But that gives you a picture of the chesed and loyal love of our great God. He loves us. And he wants to redeem us and restore us. You know, there's no pit that we can go that's too deep, that's greater than the mercy and the restoration of our great God. Boy, old Ezekiel found that out, didn't he? Do you, do you think he was set on fire to tell that story over and over again of what God had done in the back of the dead dry bones? And my brothers and sisters, that's what happened when God sends revival to his church. And he restores and he renews and he sends an awakening of his spirit across the lost multitudes and they come where they had not even been interested. They start coming and his people begin to tell that story. It spreads all over. That's what God does. 
He says, you got to seek me and find me while I can be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Right now. Will you do it? Will you? In a year when I hear that this church has sought the Lord and you're telling the story of the restoration and awakening of God in people's lives. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and for this time now in your house with your people. Thank you, Lord, for your word, the lamp unto our feet and the light for our path. Lord, I pray. Continue to speak as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Lord, open our hearts to you. And right now, God, if there's someone here that's never trusted you as their Savior, that today would be the day after the Lord's Supper we'll have a time to respond to you. Today would be the day of salvation in their lives. If there's someone here who knows that God, they're, they're living in a hopeless state and they just simply need hope, that today, Lord, you would bring them suddenly to you to restore that hope in you and what you can do. But Lord, this is your time now. May you, O oh Lord, raise up intercessors here. May you raise up your people to seek you, that you might be found as they seek you, search for you with all their heart. I pray. And I thank you. We want to see the dead, dry bones across this country live, Lord. We want to see the churches come alive. And we will see the culture impacted, the lostness impacted by a mighty spiritual awakening. So begin that work right here, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to come down and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. You know, it's interesting, I, I, I don't get to do this much <laughs> because as I'm not a, a you know, senior pastor in the church. But recently, I, this is my second time in a few weeks that I've done it. So uh, maybe what's the Lord saying to me? I don't know. But, uh, but I, I wanted to share with you, uh, if I may, uh, out of uh, Luke 22 with regard to the Lord's Supper. And uh, it says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him and they said to, said to them, with fervent desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And you know, the Lord is, is in this moment, this time, uh, is uh, teaching us about remembering. And this great passage out of Ezekiel helps us to realize the promise as they look forward and we look back and we see the fulfillment of that great promise of hope. The resurrection, the death, the burial uh, of, of Christ allows us to live. Not just now, but for all eternity. And so uh, let's uh, partake this morning. And, um, I want us to, to be sure that our hearts are clear. And so just take a few moments right now and say, Oh God, 
uh, I want to be sure that my heart is clear before you as I partake of the Lord's Supper as a Christian. So let's, let's bow for just a moment. Father, I pray that you would cleanse us where we need to be cleansed. You'll forgive us where we need to be forgiven. And that God, that you truly would be Lord of our lives, anew and afresh, as we remember the price you paid at Calvary for our sin. As we remember the, the way in which you poured out your flesh and your blood, so that we might have life and we might live with you forever. We love you and we honor you now. We thank you. Thank you for your great forgiveness in Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. Jesus said of, uh, of the bread, says, take this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of you. Brother Chris, I'm going to ask you to come and close us in prayer and as you see fit in the service. for us to respond to the word because the word is always doing the work and so as the praise team comes and leads us during that time I will pray for us in that response time thank you Dr. Schofield for reminding us of the power of the spirit and his work that is his work in bringing us from death to life so if you're here today and you just don't know Christ as your Savior, then the Bible says you're still dead. You might say, well, I'm breathing. <laughs> yeah, but that's not real life. Uh, real life is known Christ. Real life is the, the work of Christ in you, you and me. And so if you're dead today, we want to show you life in Christ. I'm going to pray over that. And so use the time of response. Uh, I'll be down here, Pastor Scofield, will you join me? Uh, if you want to pray with one of us, there's others in this room who can pray as well. We love to hear what God's doing in your life. So let me pray for us and then we'll respond in song. God, I thank you for the ways that you are at work by your spirit. Thank you for that ruach, that, that breath of life that has been given to so many here today. Lord, but for that one or two or many who may be here and, and don't know the, the new life that's offered in Father, as they watch us uh, take of the bread and drink of the cup and, and think, what a strange thing. Uh, Lord, I pray that you might use our remembrance as a tool uh, to tell them the hope of Christ in their lives. God, thank you for your work now. May your spirit help us as we respond to the goodness of God in our lives, that you would have your own way in us. Power of the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Church family, would you stand and respond as the Lord leads?
together, having the eyes of our hearts in life, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, or the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great mind. Love, serve, and go.